Hey, back with uh, Papa's Pod. Aaron Goodman here. Um, just going to be a brief one. I'm just going to go over um, venetoclax and azacitidine for uh, uh, induction therapy for uh, unfit patients with uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, I get a lot of questions about giving this regimen from fellows, uh, some physicians in the community about how to optimally give it. And um, it took me a little bit of learning experience. You know, seven plus three, um, although associated with huge amounts of toxicity, myelosuppression, we kind of all know how to do it. You give them the seven plus three, and then they're in the hospital for a month, and they're a lot of supportive care. Venetoclax azacitidine, there's a little bit more nuances to it on how to optimally give it. So first, um, who, who do we give venetoclax uh, and azacitidine uh, to? So these are patients with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia who are deemed unfit for induction chemotherapy. Um, so over the age of 75 uh, or other uh, coexisting comorbidities that would preclude them from safely getting seven plus three. Um, at least that was the study, the VIAL study that um, led to the approval and the inclusion criteria. I will say that uh, uh, physicians who treat a lot of acute leukemia are using this in patients um, who maybe uh, are deemed to have, uh, who are going to have probably a, a poor chance of responding to traditional seven plus three, like those with complex cytogenetics and TP53 uh, uh, mutations. Uh, but the, right now, the, the, the randomized study was based off those who were deemed ineligible for 7 plus 3. Um, so the regimen, um, how, how do we do it? So you have, a, let's say, a 77-year-old uh, with acute myeloid leukemia, uh, and you want to give venetoclax plus azacitidine. So venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor, uh, and azacitidine, a hypomethylating agent. Um, uh, uh, just a side note, a lot of doctors um, will give venetoclax also with the cytobine, uh, just note that the randomized study was done with azacitidine, so I usually give with azacitidine, but I, there's probably um, no reason why I can't be given with the cytobine with, with this similar uh, outcomes. So the randomized study uh, showed an overall survival advantage. Uh, you know, patients were living over a year compared to just single agent hypomethylating agent. The complete response rate was about 65 to 70 percent, or complete response plus CRI was about 65 to 70 percent, uh, which is much better than single agent hypomethylating agent where you would expect only 20 to 30 percent. So it is better. I like it. It was a fair study. So how do I go about giving it? Okay. So um, the first thing is um, it can be given outpatient. Um, I will say a lot of patients who get their first cycle end up, I end up giving it inpatient. I mean, these are usually old kind of sick people uh, um, with acute myeloid leukemia. So I already am scared about them because I'm giving them venetoclax azacitidine. And although it can be given outpatient, um, a lot of the times I am giving it in patients. Now there are some, you know, more stable patients like an MDS to AML with just cytopenias who are a little bit more fit that I will give it outpatient. Uh, but but uh, again, I would say, you know, maybe even half the time uh, these patients are admitted for cycle one, okay? So the dosing is azacitidine 75 milligrams per meter squared. Uh, days one through seven, and the venetoclax is dosed at 400 milligrams, uh, given the the the, uh, the trial and the label was day one through 28. I'll tell you how I do it. Now, the first thing is, you know, the, the scary risk is tumor lysis syndrome, which was way more common with CLL uh, uh, than it is with AML, uh, um, but it can happen with AML. And you're actually not supposed to uh, start the medication until the white blood cell count is under 25,000. Now, a lot of these patients are MDSs to AMLs or elderly AML where they're not presenting with like a proliferative AML like FLT3 in a younger patient or NPM1 mutated disease. So uh, a lot of times they already have a, a lowish white count. But if they do have a, a higher white count than 25,000, uh, I do typically uh, start hydrea. Uh, and give for a few days also with fluids and, you know, good tumor lysis prophylaxis uh, uh, to try to get that white count down. Um, if hydrea is not doing it, you can give a, a, a low dose of cytarabine uh, or an intermediate dose of, of cytarabine to try to get those uh, white blood cells down, okay? But usually you can able to do it, okay? And once you get them down, you can start the therapy. Now, um, the ramp up is uh, 100 milligrams on day one, then 200 milligrams of venetoclax, then 400 milligrams. Um, you know, if they're inpatient, um, I do it. I try to follow the label. Although, you know, if their white counts one, you can just start the 400. They're not going to tumor lice. Um, if they're 
outpatients, I've already deemed them pretty safe. And like, it just ends up being more confusing doing the 100, 200, 400. So I, this is off label. I typically just start the 400. Uh, um, but if you're really worried about tumor lysis uh, uh, or they're in the hospital a little bit more sick, it's 100, 200, 400. And then you continue the 400 through day 28. Again, the azocytidine and given seven days in a row at 75 milligrams per meter squared. If the tumor lysis is going to happen, it's going to happen like right away. Uh, I mean, these uh, it's really effective, these, these drugs. And you check, you know, uh, a tumor lysis lab literally like six to eight hours or, or four to eight hours after the initial dose uh, uh, in the hospital. Again, you shouldn't be giving this outpatient if you're worried about uh, frank tumor lysis syndrome. So um, I, th th that's how I typically do it. Now, um, if these patients are neutropenic, uh, um, which often they are, or they're they're all gonna become neutropenic, this this regimen is 100% myelosuppressive, and neutropenia is uh, universal. Um, the question always comes, you know, as far as anti-infective prophylaxis. So so everyone I put on acyclovir, and everyone who uh, gets severe neutropenia less than 500, I put them on levofloxacin 500 daily. Uh, but the big thing is uh, azoles, like posaconazole, voriconazole, and fluconazole. So we know with 7 plus 3 uh, induction, uh, 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 voriconazole or posaconazole is very important in preventing invasive fungal infections. The, the risk of fungal infections with uh, venetoclax azacytidine, it's seemingly less. We don't have as strong of data. There are some reports, including from our group, uh, that there are some fungal infections. It's much less. And as I'll get to, if you're doing the therapy right and it's working, the patient shouldn't be neutropenic for, for months at a time. And if they are, you're doing it wrong. Um, so typically in newly diagnosed AML, um, when I'm giving venetoclax study, I don't give it with an antifungal. So um, they can get the full dose 400 milligrams because they're, you know, they're not getting chemo chemo or their gut barrier is going to be all disrupted and maybe mucositis uh, uh, um, in the, you know, so there's just less fungal infection. So I personally don't do it uh, uh, um, for newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia who's getting this regimen. Um, and if you are going to do it, and a lot of doctors do do it uh, uh, with, with uh, posaconazole, uh, um, the dosing of uh, 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 venetoclax is supposed to be 70 milligrams. Um, which is cumbersome because that's like a, a lot of pills. So I just give it with 100. You know, these are all based off like test tube models or, you know, stuff that the pharmacologists come up with in like 70 versus 100. So I give one pill at 100, although the label says give it 70 if you're going to give it with posaconazole. And if you're going to give it with fluconazole, you give it at 200. You can see though how it gets cumbersome and confusing for patients. And this is where I worry if you give them fungal prophylaxis and then you stop it and then they stand the lower dose, it's just a lot. So it just, you know, these poor patients are already going through a lot. So I, again, I just give it without fungal prophylaxis. And what's going to happen is these patients will become near, always neutropenic. And when the regimen works, you'll see the platelets come up first. Okay. So typically even as early as day 14 to 21, you'll start seeing those platelets shoot up then you know you're in business, okay? The neutral fills will still be low though. They'll typically still be zero until you stop that venetoclax because it's so myelosuppressive. So we give the venetoclax azacytidine and then on day 21, I do a bone marrow biopsy, okay? And if that bone marrow biopsy is hypocellular, less than 5% blast, I stop venetoclax. I don't do the whole 28 days. Actually, I almost always just do 21 days, okay? I don't do the whole 28 days. The more we study venetoclax and AML, it's probably less it's just as good, you know, there's some stated ash that maybe even seven days is enough. So I tip, I, I, day 21, I, I stopped the venetoclax. Uh, um, again, the labels through day 20, and I get that bone marrow biopsy. And if the bone marrow biopsy shows less than 5% blast, or it's very hypocellular, there's not many blasts, I stop. So therapy's off, and I start GCSF. And I do not start cycle two until their ANCs recovered. That's where people screw up. You do not go straight into cycle two until they have hematologic recovery. If you do go straight into cycle two, then they are just going to live neutropenic, okay? Uh, and then they, you didn't help them. You, yeah, you got rid of their AML, but you gave them chemotherapy-induced uh, cytopenias, and they're going to get sick. And so again, if you do it right, their neutropenia should stop after cycle one, and um, they'll no longer be neutropenic, and they're not going to have prolonged neutropenia and thus never needing to pose a conazole. If you do it wrong, and you just don't wait, they go into remit, they go into a CRI, they have less than 5% blast and they have some counts, uh, but they're still neutropenic or severely neutropenic and you start cycle two on day 29, then they're gonna become neutropenic again, okay? 
And so I wait till their counts recover. And that first cycle is the hardest. That's when you're clearing out their leukemia you're, uh, um, and it takes the longest for count to recover, sometimes 30, 40, sometimes even 50 days, you know, and then I start uh, the second cycle on ANC recovery, typically above 1,000 and some platelets above 75,000, okay? And then each subsequent cycle, I watch them. And now they're starting cycle two with robust counts. And typically their cytopenias won't be as bad. So as long as their platelets don't dip really below 50,000, I'm cool with it. And they typically don't. Uh, um, um, and their neutropenia, you know, you don't want to see prolonged grade four neutropenia. If they have an ANC less than 500 for a week in remission, then the subsequent cycle, I will lower the venetoclax by seven days. So if you started at 28, then 21, or if you started at 21, then 14. Again, I'm typically starting with 21 days. So they typically, you know, if the next cycle, they have a prolonged duration of cytopenias, you know, I at least say, you know, like a week of ANC less than 500 uh, or severe thrombocytopenia, then the next cycle, I'll do it 14 days. And you keep on doing that until they are in remission and have very mild cytopenias. And some people do fine on 21 days. Some people need 14. Some people need seven days. And some people, after the first two cycles, they just can't tolerate the venetoclax, and that's fine. They got in their remission, and the, you just continue the azacitidine. Uh, um, so, so that's really how I do it, and I can't stress enough the importance of allowing for count recovery. Now, if on cycle one they have, like, they blow through it on cycle one, you know, like their marrow is still packed, you can give cycle two. Um, I've not seen responses, you know, usually if they're going to be refractory to it. Um, but if they have like an intermediate response where they've had some improvement, but still have some blasts, then I don't wait for count recovery and I go into cycle two. And a lot of those patients, you can convert to CR by cycle two. And then you do the same thing again on cycle two and get a bone marrow biopsy on day 21, assess their blast count. And usually after two to three cycles of NAs, if it's not working, it's not working. Uh, um, um, so, um, you know, uh, again, you know, um, if they're persistent disease, but they've had some response, then you do go into the subsequent cycle without holding uh, uh, therapy. So that's how I do it in newly diagnosed uh, uh, disease. Uh, how do, you know, we use this off-label now in relapse disease um, or in patients post-allogenic transplant for relapse. In those patients, the risk of fungal infection seems higher. Um, Again, the data is not so great, but uh, in my experience, that's what it seems. And in some of the data suggests that. In those patients, I put them all on fungal prophylaxis, especially if they're post allo So those patients will start on posiconazole and start with a lower dose of venetoclax 100, okay? And uh, uh, um, again, you know, uh, some of these patients will have durable remissions, okay? So again, the goal is... Um, to minimize cytopenias, it's going to happen the first cycle, but if they go into remission, subsequent cycles, you should not be doing seeing severe cytopenias. If you are, you are doing it wrong and you need to dose reduce the venetoclax uh, by in seven day blocks is again, how most of us do it. Um, and I think that that pretty much covers how I do uh, venetoclax uh, is a cytidine. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, once like that cycle, so the first cycle from doing an outpatient, they're getting labs pretty frequently, two to three times a week. But once they get cycle two, you know, if they're recovering weekly labs, and then in some patients they're doing so good by cycle three, four, I have them just getting labs like once a month and it's very rewarding. I got someone over the age of 90 who's a few years into this stuff. Uh, um, uh, and I had another one uh, uh, close to 100, he only tolerated the venetoclax for a few cycles. Then he was just too neutropenic, but then I'm maintaining him on an, a, on an HMA. And again, I think the nice thing about venetoclax, it's really good at inducing the remissions, uh, 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 unlike azacitidine on its own. Uh, but whether you need it indefinitely with the azacitidine is not as clear. Again, if they can tolerate, then I do it. So this Papahim, um, I hope you enjoyed how to give venetoclax azacitidine. Um, until next time, uh, um, I'll see you guys later.